Scott Brown, and Elizabeth Warren, face each other today, in the third of four debates, in this highly tested Senate race, for the right to represent Massachusetts. We do have some rules this evening. Our audience of more than 2,600 guests has agreed to be silent. No interruptions, no applause until the end. Each candidate will have a minute and 30 seconds to answer each question, then each will get 30 seconds for further comment or rebuttal. Later, each candidate gets one minute for a closing statement. Separate coin tosses have determined the speaking order for both segments. The Springfield Debate Consortium asked the public to send us questions they'd like to hear, and we received more than 200. Thank you very much. Just about every question tonight comes directly from or is based on an idea from the public. We're very pleased about that. The Warren campaign won the first coin toss. They decided to take the first question first, so let's get started. First question, Ms. Warren. Just last week, we saw the national unemployment numbers fall below 8%, but we know that still means millions of Americans are looking for jobs, and things are especially difficult in minority communities, inner cities. What are the growth areas in the economy where you see future jobs coming from, developing? What will it take? What will you do if elected to support job growth? So thank you very much, Jim, and thanks so much to everyone for being so hospitable here in Springfield. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm glad you started with jobs because we have nearly 200,000 people unemployed here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and as you know, more people unemployed, higher unemployment rates here in Springfield and Holyoke. Uh, it's a serious problem. So I look at this as a short-term problem and a long-term problem in terms of solutions. Short-term, we should put people back to work with jobs bills. That's why I was so surprised when Senator Brown voted against three jobs bills in a row that would have supported 22,000 jobs here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, would have prevented layoffs of teachers, firefighters, and police officers, would have put construction workers back to work. And why? Because it would have meant an increase in taxes, not for most people, but for those making a million dollars or more. In the long term, it's going to be about making the right investments, about investing in infrastructure, you know, like Union Station or, uh, 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 or the great uh, the corridor, the knowledge corridor. Going to take me a second here, but I'll get there. Uh, making these investments because this is what lets areas grow. Making the investments in education, making the investments in research. We make those investments together and we build a future. That's what it's going to take over the long run to build a stronger future here in western Massachusetts, all across the Commonwealth and all across the country. It's time, Mr. Brown. Jim, thank you. I want to thank you and the consortium and Professor Warren. Uh, before I start, I want to obviously thank uh, Mayor Ryan for your endorsement and support and uh, Bob Cousy for coming and your endorsement as well. Thank you both for coming. Uh, this is actually about jobs and the economy. The whole race is about that. And that's why uh, we held one of our first job fairs here in Chicopee, trying to connect people uh, with jobs that are for employers who are out there looking to hire and grow and expand. Uh, but when you put a title on a bill in Washington and says jobs bills, you have to read the bill. You have to see how it affects everybody else. And those bills in particular, first of all, were rejected in a bipartisan manner. That means Democrats and Republicans recognized that by taking $450 billion of taxes out of the, pri out of, out of the private sector and giving it to Washington to actually increase government spending, uh, that's not the answer. The best answer is to come in and put the money in the communities. When I was at Milano's today for lunch, I went down there and he didn't say to me, oh, Scott, thanks for coming. I appreciate you coming. Uh, please take this money and bring it back to Washington. He said, go back to Washington and tell them they need a reality check. They need to understand that we're tired of the overspending, the taxing, and the taking of more and more money out of the economy. And you have some very real challenges here in western Massachusetts. I used to live here. I worked uh, down on State Street. I, I lived over near Winnick. I, I understand. I visited, obviously, Friendly's and Milano's, the Big E, Mass Mutual, and many other businesses, and they're hurting right now. They, they have a lack of regulatory and tax certainty, and that's the big biggest challenge that they have. It's time, sir. Ms. Warren, you have another 30 seconds. You know, tomorrow will be the one-year anniversary of Senator Brown's first vote against jobs, 22,000 jobs here in Massachusetts. I hope everybody who knows someone who's unemployed, every business who would have liked to have seen those paychecks spent in their shops will remember that, because that's how we jumpstart the economy. We get work that needs to be done, and we put people back to work. But Senator Brown made it clear with that bill where he stands. The bill would have cost millions 
millionaires, those making a million or more every year would have paid for it. He stood with the millionaires, not those who are out of work. That's time. You got five extra seconds. You got 35 seconds. Thank, thank you, Jim. Actually, uh, it's also the one anniversary of me uh, protecting people's pocketbooks and wallets and making sure that $450 billion uh, didn't go out of the private sector into Washington so they could spend it. Uh, bottom line is uh, you need to create that, that regulatory and tax certainty. And when I'm going to Westover and Barnes and fighting for military jobs and trying to create that, 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 that ability for them to obviously stay in business and all the ancillary jobs that go along with it, I'm very proud that my third vote was actually a bipartisan jobs bill. I supported the president's jobs bill because it made sense. It didn't raise taxes, and we need to do it better. Time, sir. Perfect. Next question goes first to Mr. Brown. Depending on what happens on Election Day, it is entirely possible that the numbers will be set up in such a way in January, both houses controlled by the Republican Party, and that would seem to mean the repeal of Obamacare. But health care costs continue to rise. We know that. Recent evidence reveals introduction of electronic medical records is not saving the money it was thought. It's further escalating costs at hospitals and physicians are reportedly upcoding, charging Medicare perhaps higher levels than they're supposed to. Now, now granted, that is a problem of fraud, but very hard to catch, very hard to investigate. Overall, what do we do about the continuing health care cost problem? Would you support as well replacement of fee-for-service reimbursement with a global fee approach to try to help reduce the rising costs? Well, thank you, Jim, and I appreciate that question. Obviously, health care is something that affects every person and every business in Massachusetts. That's why I was proud as a state senator to actually work on our health care bill that actually ensures 98 percent of our people and many children, 98, 99 percent of our children are insured as well. And we did it without raising taxes. Uh, and we did it without this one-size-fits-all. We have, uh, obviously, the Cadillac plans all the way down to the fully subsidized Commonwealth care plans. But the federal, the federal bill, which my opponent supports and I don't, actually raises taxes, 18 new taxes that are about to click in, and some of them are actually doing that now. It also cuts, and I hope the seniors are listening, three-quarters of a trillion dollars from our seniors' Medicare, and that's something I can support. Uh, the folks that have the so-called Cadillac tax plans, the, the teachers and, and, uh, and union members and others, uh, they're going to be taxed tens of thousands of dollars once this plan is fully implemented. And it's something that we, we, I can't certainly support. We need to, uh, listen, I believe that everybody should have uh, health care. That's why I've supported what we did here in Massachusetts. And I believe other states should be incentivized to actually do what we've done. We can actually go and, and tell them what we've done and how we've done it and let them do it like we did. But to think that the federal government is going to go and tell Massachusetts where we have the best doctors, nurses, hospitals in the world, uh, it's unacceptable. With regard to the coding system, it's something that uh, many uh, care providers are, are talking about, that the codes change regularly. There's, there's really no certainty and stability with regard to the, the payment structure. It's something we need to continue to work on. That is time, sir. Ms. Warren, 90 seconds. Well, you're exactly right about the possible control of the Senate, and uh, Scott Brown has made it clear. His first job will be to try to repeal the Affordable Care Act so that we go back and have more years of fighting over health care. I don't think that's where the American people want to be, and I don't think it's good for us. You know, he raises the same old argument that there will be more than $700 billion taken out of Medicare. That's the same playbook that Mitt Romney used a week ago tonight. It was wrong then. It's wrong tonight. What has happened is that the money is that there is not money being taken out of Medicare. AARP has made this clear. The plan is to take waste, fraud, and insurance subsidies out and strengthen Medicare. But keep in mind, what Senator Brown is in favor of is getting rid of a bill that right now helps seniors pay for prescription drugs, closes the so-called donut hole. 11,000 seniors here in Massachusetts are getting help paying for their prescription medications. There's a lot that the Affordable Care Act does, and a big part of it is to help bring down health care costs. There are going to be changes in billing practices, but also investment in a lot of research in how to get better outcomes at lower costs. I am so proud to be from Massachusetts, where most of that research is being done. And this is going to be a big driver for the economy here in Massachusetts, and ultimately for saving health care around the country. It's time, Mr. Brown. You have 30 seconds. Thank you, Jim. Uh, bottom line is, uh, any of the seniors that are listening or in the crowd, you need to pay attention. It's uh, three quarters of a trillion dollars that my opponent supports, and I don't. Uh, to think that you can cut that.
that amount of money and not have it affect your care and coverages is just wrong. Uh, the fact that we already have it here in Massachusetts and to think that the federal government is going to really, uh, I think, almost dumb down what we've done here in Massachusetts where we have the greatest hospitals, doctors, nurses, I think, in the world, uh, it's not something I can support. Uh, we have an opportunity in Massachusetts. This is a jobs-crushing uh, bill that is going to crush Massachusetts businesses. You have 18 new taxes coming in, three-quarters of a trillion dollars, and I don't support it. So we've got about seven extra seconds, so you can take up to 37. All right, there we go. So Senator Brown is going to double down on a number that simply is not true. AARP has made it clear that the changes that the Affordable Care Act does for Medicare strengthens Medicare and does not cut benefits by even one penny. Senator Brown wants to talk about taxes. Keep in mind, there's only a trillion dollars in tax cuts in the Affordable Care Act. It comes to people who are purchasing health insurance and to the small businesses that are providing health insurance. It's good for us here in Massachusetts. Thank you very much. Next question goes first to Ms. Warren. College debt for students and their families. We know, uh, we learned last spring, it now tops $1 trillion nationwide, trillion with a T. Higher education is collectively the largest employer in western Massachusetts, the largest industry here. So that number means a lot to us. What would you do, what more can or should Washington do, if anything, to address the soaring cost of college and the debt students face? You know, I really appreciate the question. I'm somebody who went to public schools. I went to a commuter college, and I ended up as a professor. And I got to do that because of the opportunities afforded me by a good education that America invested in. But now we live in a world where there's far too little investment, particularly in higher education. You know, there are four great community colleges in this area. We need to be making the investments in those community colleges. Why? For a couple of reasons partly because it's a good, affordable way for kids to get an education, and partly because it helps us build a future. Precision technology here in Western Mass, this is a real opportunity for the future, but only if there's a well-educated workforce. That starts in high school, goes on through community colleges, and on into public universities. What can we do to help them? I want to say that this is about priorities. That's just how I see it. There's not going to be a single magic bullet, but watch the priorities. Students are having to pick up more and more of the costs through student loans. Twice last year, Senator Brown voted to let student interest rates double. Why? Because it would have uh, forced to pay for it, closing a loophole used by millionaires. In fact, it's called the Newt Gingrich loophole, uh, maybe used recently by Mitt Romney. The whole idea is to say, what are your priorities? Is it protecting loopholes for millionaires or helping college kids pay for an education? That's time. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Jim. Great question. Obviously, the uh, cost of education is out of sight. Uh, we need to have an educated uh, student population. I just had my youngest daughter graduate, and I understand what those payments certainly are. And one of the largest uh, driving forces behind the high cost of education is administrative costs. And as we know, uh, Professor Warren makes about three hundred. $50,000 to teach one course. Uh, she got, uh, she got, she got a zero interest loan from Harvard and gets housing and other perks. And it's it's interesting. So picture this: kids are actually forced to go out and actually borrow money at a high interest rate, and then they pay it to schools like Harvard. And then Harvard actually goes and then gives a, a zero interest loan to its professors. That's one of the driving forces behind the high cost of education. That energy, health care, as you, any people know right now, they've actually, uh, if you're paying for health care for your students, it's gone up as a result of uh, Obamacare uh, to about $1,500 uh, per, uh, per policy. In addition to that, um, Jim, you have uh, a situation also where we have done a lot with uh, providing benefits and opportunities for our students, and we need to continue to do that. I'm looking forward. Uh, you know, it's funny. She, uh, she, there she goes again with regard to uh, talking about student uh, interest rates. Uh, I voted against it because I didn't want to see our small business owners pay $6 billion uh, to pay for low interest rates. I, I voted against it. We stopped it. And then we worked and rolled up our sleeves and actually did it without taxing people and without uh, using any additional federal funds. Time, sir. 
Ms. Warren, 30 seconds. So look, I went to a commuter college. I paid $50 a semester for tuition, and I'm proud to have made it where I've made it in my profession. But let's be clear, I paid $50 a semester because America was investing in public colleges and universities at the time. That's what we need to do again. Senator Brown, the question about voting, I think this shows one more time whose side are you on? Loopholes for millionaires or college loans for our kids? I want to go with our kids. That's time, and Mr. Brown, you have 30 Thank seconds. Thank you. Listen, we actually passed uh, that uh, bill to keep student uh, interest rates low. We did it by uh, working together in a truly bipartisan way to get it done. We did not tax. I mean, she says uh, millionaires and billionaires. No, it's the sub S corporations, the ordinary businesses that would have had to, in fact, pay that six billion dollars to keep student interest rates low. Uh, we did it. We we did it together. Uh, we tweaked some federal programs. We found the money, and it was through me and my leadership working with both sides that we got that done. I'm sir. Thank you very much. Please, I'm, I'm going to remind the audience. It only takes time away, literally, when you applaud a line from your candidate, it takes time away from them. Please don't. Let's uh, go down to another question first from Mr. Brown. Let's stay with education. Communities, we know, are stretching and struggling to pay for local schools. Many costs are based on federal mandates, sometimes unfunded federal mandates and requirements. What should the role of the federal government be in local education? How would you help local schools? Well, thank you, Jim, for that question. I, when I was a state senator, I was on education one and two. The the uh, obviously primary and then secondary education worked very hard to provide the tools and resources to our communities to in fact uh, provide the funding helped uh, get funding to build new schools and uh, obviously very proud of that uh, very supportive of the new initiatives put forth by the president uh, that are being initiated by secretary duncan uh, we're doing a lot and i've never voted for a, a mandate i think uh, the unfunded mandates not only from the federal government but the state government are one of the things that's killing uh, communities like springfield and and everybody in western mass and throughout our great state. Uh, but once again, it's the high cost of education that's driving that train. And as uh, just to go back, since I have a little time, on the student interest rates, uh, you know, bottom line is, Jim, you, you can't rewrite my record. We took some procedural votes, drew a line in the sand, and made sure that we actually did it without raising taxes. Her constant criticisms of me are the fact that I don't want to raise taxes on any Americans and any people from Massachusetts. We did it without raising taxes by tweaking federal programs and finding a way to do it better. Now, uh, when you come to opportunities on jobs and job creation, I worked very hard uh, as a state senator and will continue to to work with our community college. In Bristol Community College, we find that, for, which is out where I live, you have opportunities where the businesses in the area are actually working directly uh, with the universities and the colleges to uh, develop a workforce that you can actually have uh, for that particular business. And that's something I've supported, will continue to support, and look forward to the opportunity. Thank you, sir. That's time. Ms. Warren, 90 seconds. So I think you were asking about what we're going to do for the younger kids in education. And it's a wonderful question. I want to start with saying how proud I am to be from Massachusetts again, where we've made investments in education, and our kids have done well. They just haven't done as well as we think they can if we do better. So the way I see this is that Massachusetts, the local cities and towns, should come up with their own ideas. But they need a good federal partner in Washington. And I'll give you one example of what a good federal partner can do. A good federal partner can put money into STEM, into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, can help make sure that we have more teachers in the school and more opportunities for our kids in junior high and high school, make sure that they have the opportunities to get the grounding they need so they can go on to universities, so they can go on to community colleges, get better training training and be part of a well-educated workforce out here in Massachusetts. Moving down to even younger kids, I just want to make clear, I believe that every dollar we invest in Head Start and even pre-Head Start is something that pays off many, many, many times over that child's lifetime. It's an investment we should be making. We need to invest in our children. That's our moral responsibility and frankly, it's just good economics.
And Mr. Brown, 30 seconds. Well, actually, Jim, we agree. Uh, it's something that I feel is very important. Uh, obviously, uh, growing up, I'm from here, as you know, went to Wakefield High, Tufts University, and Boston College Law School. Uh, I've been working very hard as a selectman and state rep, state senator, and now as a United States senator to try to find ways that we can uh, do it all, where we can actually provide a good value for our dollar, accountability for our students and our teachers, having parental involvement, and trying to find ways to uh, you know, stretch the, the, the dollars that we pay to st state and federal government. Uh, there's a lot more work to do. Uh, we'll hopefully uh, continue to That's work. Uh, it's time. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Thank part. you. Thank no, you. I'm sorry if I misread. Uh, very good. Uh, Ms. Warren, you have 30 seconds. Well, I'm glad that Senator Brown agrees, but I want to make clear that if the Republicans take over control of the United States Senate, they've made it pretty clear that in order to pay for the tax cuts for the richest Americans, they're going to make cuts elsewhere. What's the only proposal on the table? More than half a trillion dollars in cuts in what? education, basic infrastructure, and research. To have a good federal partner in Washington, we have to make funding education a priority. It's time, and this question goes first to Ms. Warren. To deal with the federal deficit and cut spending, which apparently we are going to have to do, can you tell us where you would look first and last? Can you identify two federal programs you definitely think should be cut or scrapped, and two that would be sacrosanct for you that you would work very hard to protect? Sure. Uh, I, you are exactly right. We're going to have to take a balanced approach to this, but I would be clear in terms of cutting the agriculture subsidy programs, and it is time to cut in our military budget. We are winding out of one war. We have ended another one. We can realign our priorities. On the other hand, I want to make clear, I will not go to Washington to cut Medicare or Social Security benefits. That is not what we should be doing. When we talk about a balanced approach, we need to be talking about spending cuts and we need to be talking about increasing revenues. It takes both to close the, uh, to close the deficit. Senator Brown and I both submitted our economic proposals to the Boston Globe. They were sent out for independent economic analysis. And what the independent economists found was that I was 67 percent more effective at cutting the deficit than Senator Brown. Why? Because I am willing to make cuts. I'm willing to make substantial cuts. Indeed, I support substantial cuts. But I also believe we have to raise revenues. That's what it's going to take to get serious about our deficit. I truly believe on this one. This is about our children and our grandchildren. We cannot leave it to our grandchildren to pay off our debts. We have to take the hard steps now. It's time. 90 seconds, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Jim. Great question. Obviously, we're in the $16 trillion national debt, folks. Uh, we're in another trillion dollar deficit, and we can't keep borrowing 42 cents on every dollar uh, to pay our bills. We just can't. And when you're talking about uh, cutting military spending, with all due respect, we've already cut a half a trillion dollars. That affects Barnes and Westover and many people in this room and people watching. And I've been battling uh, as a member of the Armed Services Committee and uh, Veterans and Homeland to try to find the resources to protect our men and women who are serving. As you know, we have sequestration coming up. It's something that we're trying to work in a bipartisan effort to step back from that. And one of the first things I cut is $2 trillion as a result of the uh, Obamacare. It's not good for Massachusetts. It crushes Massachusetts. Massachusetts businesses. I would sell all federal uh, unused property that's excess. Uh, we don't need it. I would do that top to bottom review of every federal program. Give the president a line item veto. veto. And if, if there's anybody listening who thinks that my opponent is a tax cutter, uh, let, me, let me get rid of that myth. I've never voted for a tax increase, and I'm not going to be raising taxes on any American. Uh, we need to have a balanced budget amendment. It's something that we absolutely need. We do it in the state, we do it in our homes, we do it in our businesses. And and that's a big difference. The first thing every single time is let's raise taxes, raise taxes. The National Federation of Independent Businesses analyzed her tax plan. 17,000 jobs in Massachusetts would be cut. Many people in this room are watching would be affected by those cuts. I am not going to be putting our businesses and individuals' lives and, and, and jobs in jeopardy. I'm sir, thank you. And Ms. Warren, 30 seconds. So Senator Brown says that he will cut health care. But keep in mind, the Congressional Budget Office scores that as that's going to increase our debt, not decrease our debt. So what does he cite? He cites a study from the National Federation of Independent Businesses. 
Same page out of uh, Governor Romney's playbook from a week ago tonight. It was wrong then, and it's wrong now. The study that he's talking about, A, doesn't use my name, doesn't analyze anything I did, doesn't use the president's, but keep in mind who this group is. Can I finish? I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, thanks. And we'll have even now. Go ahead. This is a group that endorsed Senator Brown and other Republicans and refers to Ted Kennedy as public enemy number one. That's who they are. Okay. That's 15, so we'll give you at 45 seconds, well, Senator well, Brown. First of all, listen, uh, if anyone here thinks that the national health care bill is not going to be bad for Massachusetts, then they don't understand the bills. They haven't read the bills. They don't see how it dramatically increases 18 new taxes in Massachusetts. Medical device companies in Massachusetts are going to be crushed. Our seniors who have Medicare are going to be, are going to be hammered in the coverages and care that they get in hospitals. Uh, when you're looking at the Chamber of Commerce, it's the, it's the premier independent uh, small business group who analyzed her proposals of letting the tax cuts expire at 700,000 jobs. She said that those numbers were made up. Listen, they're not, with all due respect, they're not made up. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce said that her, uh, her involvement in this race is, is catastrophically anti-business. And uh, we, we just can't continue to focus on raising taxes, raising That's taxes, fine, raising sir. taxes. Thank you both very much. I haven't heard it tonight, but in both the presidential and in your campaigns, I've heard the words middle class used a lot. What do you mean when you say middle class? And this will go first to Mr. Brown. Uh, what, are you, what are you talking about in terms of income levels, living standard, maybe even values? What do you mean when you say middle class? Well, I don't think it's a value issue. I think certainly it talks about, uh, obviously, people's incomes. And it comes down to whose side you're on when you're fighting for the middle class. I've been working very hard uh, since my days as, a, as an assessor, trying to get proper property valuations. And as a selectman, getting good trash and police and fire contracts, trying to maximize the dollars that we all pay to the state and local, state, and federal governments. When I think of middle class, I think about hardworking men and women who sometimes have one or two or maybe even a third job. Uh, sometimes the kids will work and contributed. Obviously, the number varies on which state you're at and, and geographically, but uh, bottom line is it's all about whose side you're on. And we know from past experience that Professor Warren has said that she's out there fighting for you, fighting for the middle class. When we learn, in fact, she's fighting for the large corporations, travelers insurance, getting almost a quarter of a million dollars, fighting to deny people uh, benefits for asbestos uh, settlements, LTV Steel, fighting to protect large corporations over the, the union workers who are going to get their health care. And then we also find out Dow Chemical working to make sure the limited liability for women who got the a faulty breast implants. It is about whose side you're on. It is about fighting for the middle class. And I want to continue to do as I've done it uh, before. And in addition to that, the one thing we can't be doing right now in the middle of this three and a half year recession is by taking more money out of people's hard working pocketbooks and wallets and giving it to the federal government. They're like, they're like pigs in a trough up there. They will just take and take and take and take. I'm losing control. But Ms. Warren, you have a minute and a half. Well, so this has been pretty much my life's work, is talking about what's happening to America's middle class. And let's face it, America's middle class has just been getting hammered. And Washington doesn't work for them. Washington works for those who can hire an army of lobbyists and an army of lawyers. In fact, that's why I'm in this race. What is America's middle class? And that's the people who work hard. They play by the rules. And most of all, they invest in the future because they believe if they do those things, their kids are going to have a better chance than they did, and their grandkids are going to have a better chance than that. And that's what I see as the two different visions in this race overall, the race here in Massachusetts and the race nationally. You know, the Republicans have a vision, cut taxes for those at the top and let the, let the, let the chips fall where they may for everybody else. I think we can do better than that, and we can do better than that for America's middle class, for America's working families, for America's poor families who want those opportunities. What I believe is that everybody pays a fair share, and that means the millionaires, that means the billionaires, that means the big oil companies. And then, and then we make those investments in the future. 
We invest in education. We invest in infrastructure. We invest in ourselves and our kids. That's why those are the issues I want to talk about in this race. Senator Brown doesn't want to talk about his voting record. He just wants to launch a tax. That's time. Thank and you. Mr. Brown, another 30. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, it is about whose side you're on. It is when you're talking about uh, getting hammered. Uh, Professor Warren, I suggest you put down the hammer uh, because it's your regulations and, and your policies that are going to be hurting. Seconds, Thank you. Go, please. Uh, the, your policies and, and uh, that are going to be uh, hurting middle class families and every class of family in Massachusetts and the United States. Talk about lobbyists and army of lawyers. You have uh, Massachusetts premier lobbyist Doug Rubin working for you in terms of uh, lo army of lawyers. You're one of them. You're one of the hired guns that actually went out and got paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to fight against the That's people time, that sir. you're actually talking about. That's time. So we give you an extra 10. We'll, we'll do the same. Ms. Warren, 40 okay. seconds. So I'm really glad you raised the question of regulations. Senator Brown's right. I went to Washington to fight for a new consumer agency to make sure that people didn't get cheated on mortgages, on credit cards, and on student loans. That's what I fought for. And that little agency, baby agency, just been out there a year on its own, it's already returned nearly half a billion dollars to consumers who've gotten cheated. I think the way, that's the way that the system ought to work. And I'll continue to fight for that. Very good. I'll, I'll give you each 15 seconds more. Listen, I, I commend you for your work on that. I, I voted for it. It uh, never would have passed if I was not the deciding vote on the financial reform. And, uh, as you know, I, I actually made it better. Senator Reid and I actually went in and we actually put in a, a, a provision in there to protect our men and women service members who are going to be uh, taken advantage of by the predatory lenders. So I commend you for that and uh, I'm glad I was able to help uh, put it into effect. That's about 25, so go ahead, 25. Well, as long as we're talking about Dodd-Frank, let's talk about what Senator Brown did after Dodd-Frank passed. That is, it came out in the Boston Globe that he was out working in secret to weaken the regulations so the biggest financial institutions on Wall Street wouldn't have to deal with such difficult regulations. I think this is one more case of Senator Brown making it clear where he stands. He's taken more than $2 million in contributions, and as the Boston That's Globe says, he really delivers for That's where we're, we're coming up on time. I owe you, believe it or not, five seconds, Senator. Uh, you <laughs> thank you, Jim. I'd like to start right now. <laughs> five seconds. I'm timing it. Thank you. Listen, I'm going to fight for Massachusetts jobs. Mass, uh, Mass Mutual uh, is the company that she's referring to that I was out there fighting for, and I was proud to do it. That's it. Perfect. Okay, back on time. I'm going to give everybody who's setting and watching the time about two seconds to take a breather, get reset. They're ready. Let's go. Uh, Ms. Warren, first to you. Where would you stand if the idea of eliminating the mortgage interest uh, tax deduction were put forward as part of a tax reform or deficit reduction? Uh, I would not support ending the mortgage deduction for middle class families. Uh, they've been hammered enough and they just can't take it. So my answer is for working people, no. Reset and uh, you're you're fine. Okay, you have a minute if you want it. No, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Another minute. You want to go on for we're, mortgage we're, interest yeah, a minute, We're in the minute and a half section. Go sorry ahead. about that. So, but I think this is about you're asking the right question, and that is. Where are we going to raise revenues? And what Senator Brown has done is taken the Grover Nordquist pledge, making sure he has said that he will not raise taxes by one dollar on millionaires, on billionaires, on big oil. And that's exactly what he has voted for. So on the Buffett rule, for example, asking billionaires to pay a fair share, pay at least at the rate that their secretaries pay, Senator Brown voted with the billionaires, not with the secretaries. On the question of oil subsidies. An industry where the big five made $137 billion in profits last year. Senator Brown said keep those subsidies flowing to the oil companies. For me, what this is all about is that we have got to find the right balance in the system. We've got to go to a sensible place. And so when the question comes of the expiring tax credits what, uh, so that uh, taxes could go up for 98% of the families here in Massachusetts and 97 percent of small businesses. Senator Brown said he voted against that, would let taxes go up 
unless there were bigger breaks for the top 2%. This is truly about whose side you stand on. And that's time. And it's now 90 seconds for you, Senator. Thank you, Jim. Uh, listen, I'm glad uh, Grover Norquist uh, agrees with me. Uh, we shouldn't be raising taxes on anybody in the middle of a three-and-a-half-year recession. Uh, let's make it clear. I'm not going to be raising taxes on anyone in Massachusetts or anyone in the United States. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a fiscal and financial emergency right now. We do not need to do every single time, say, take, take, take more and more money out of people's pocketbooks and wallets. On the Buffett rule, listen, we have our own Buffett rule here in Massachusetts. We have an opportunity for people who want to pay more, and they can, and uh, prefer Professor Warren chose not to uh, check that box and make that contribution. So it's okay to go and take everybody else's money, but before uh, you know, we, we do that, we really need to kind of practice what we preach. When you're talking about oil uh, and, and our energy producers, I'm not sure if anyone's been to the pump. I was driving through Springfield, and it's about four dollars a gallon. If you think that by by eliminating or raising eliminating uh, deductions and, or raising taxes on our energy producers in the in the middle of the winter that's about to produce, uh, come up to us, uh, they're going to pass. Those, uh, those tax increases off to you, and you're going to be paying more as you fill up your, your, your car, as you fill up your oil tanks for the cold winter. And we need to have a comprehensive tax reform with regard to the mortgage interest, charitable deductions, and a whole host of other things. We need to do a top-to-bottom review of our tax code, get everybody in the same room, and work it out together. We can't be pitting people against each other. It needs to be done in a truly bipartisan manner. And as somebody who's the second most bipartisan senator in the United States Senate, I've done it. I'm going to continue to do it. And... Uh, and I'm proud to be that way. Time, sir. Thank you. Ms. Warren, another 30 seconds. So I think I just heard Senator Brown say that instead of working for the people of Massachusetts, he's taken a pledge to work for Grover Nordquist uh, to make sure that no tax deal occurs that costs millionaires or billionaires even one dollar more. But what Senator Brown has said he would do is let more than two trillion dollars of tax cuts or tax cuts expire for 98 percent of the families here in Massachusetts. Why? Because there's not a big enough break for the top 2%. Those are the wrong priorities. It's time, and you have 30 seconds, sir. Listen, I think it's a great priority to make sure that we can provi uh, protect our job creators. The people uh, that 2% you're talking about are the people that are actually out there creating jobs. And many of those, substantial amount of those people are actually hired by uh, those job creators. To think that, uh, it makes a great sound bite, uh, Professor, but as you know, that those expiring tax cuts would only fund the government for about 10 to 15 days. Uh, we need to have a comprehensive approach to this, and the only way it's going to be done is to be done together. Very good. Let's move on now to another question. First to Mr. Brown. How do you feel you differ from your opponent in the area of women's rights and women's issues, specifically Paycheck Fairness Act, insurance coverage for contraceptives, and states that have moved in some cases or tried to require special preliminary procedures for women who may be seeking medical procedures, gynecological or abortion-related medical procedures? Well, thank you, uh, Jim. Good question. Uh, as you know, I live in a house full of women. Uh, two of them are right there and have been fighting since I was six years old to protect women's rights. Uh, my mom, when she was getting uh, abused by an abusive uh, husband and my stepfather, and then again as 18 years old as I was battling to keep us safe, my sister and I. So I've been fighting for women's rights uh, since then. We're both pro-choice. We both support Roe v. Wade. Uh, there's no secret about that. Uh, I believe very, uh, obviously very much in women getting the same pay and benefits, but we need to find a way, as, the, uh, as you uh, have heard from the Boston Globe and the NFIB and the Boston Herald when you referred to the Paycheck Fairness, the right idea but the wrong bill. We already have Lily Ledbetter that's in effect. It's, it's actually helping in that regard. We have other causes of action, the Mass Commission of, uh, Against Discrimination. When it comes to women's rights, as I said, I'm pro-choice. I'm the guy that when the House tried to strip out Planned Parenthood, I fought to restore it in, in the Senate. Uh, I'm a co-sponsor, one of the main sponsors against, uh, with the Violence Against Women Act, because I lived through that. I think it's important to protect women, especially when they're being abused, allow women to uh, participate in combat, uh, women who have abortions in the military. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the original Republican sponsor to make sure that uh, they can get the care and coverages that they need. So when it comes to, obviously, protecting women's rights, you know, I'm happy to continue to, to fight as I've done in the past. Uh, you can cherry-pick votes, certainly, and try to distort things, but uh, bottom line is uh, I'm, I'm very happy with what I've done, and I'm going to continue to work. And that is time, and Ms. Warren, 90 seconds. 
So I have no doubt that Senator Brown is a good husband and a good father to his daughters. But this is an issue that affects all of our daughters and our granddaughters. And what matters here is how Senator Brown votes. So he's gone to Washington and he's had some good votes. But he's had exactly one chance to vote uh, for equal pay, for equal work, and he voted no. He had exactly one chance to vote for insurance coverage for birth control and other preventive services for women. He voted no. And he had exactly one chance to vote for a pro-choice woman from Massachusetts to the United States Supreme Court, and he voted no. Those are bad votes for women. The women of Massachusetts need a senator they can count on, not some of the time, but all of the time. I want to go to Washington to be there for all of our daughters and all of our granddaughters. This one really matters. There's a lot at stake here. You have another 20 seconds if you wish. No, Let's you know, I think that says it all. I am, I am a mother of a daughter and the grandmother of granddaughters. And this is about their future, and I want to be blunt. We should not be fighting about equal pay for equal work and access to birth control in 2012. These issues were resolved years ago until the Republicans brought them back. And that's time. Mr. Brown, another 30 seconds. Uh, thank you, Jim. Listen, uh, as I've said, we're, we're both pro-choice, um, and uh, we're working very hard. I think we would agree on, on that fact that we're both pro-choice and, and care very deeply about what happens to women. But to refer to the votes you're talking about, I'm not going to be pitting Catholics against the church and their faith. I'm going fi to fight to make sure that any legislation that comes up is not going to be uh, basically uh, prohibiting people to practice their faith. We did it in Massachusetts in our own health care bill. We already have the ability to have to do both. We actually provide the care and coverages that women deserve. Uh, we also provide the ability for people in, in churches and hospitals to practice their faith. We did it. To think people are going to be time, losing sir. their care and... Excuse Please. Me. Oh, I'm sorry. Perhaps there's a, a mistake which we have two I, time I, screens. No, I apologize. I sorry. I apologize no um, for any confusion. You will have, if you wish, now 40 seconds so that we keep it even. All right. So I just want to be clear on this. This is about how the senator votes. He can come up with a lot of excuses, but the reality is he voted. He had one chance to vote for equal pay for equal work, and he voted against it. He had one chance to vote for insurance coverage on birth control, and he voted against it. He had one chance to vote for a pro-choice woman to the United States Supreme Court, and he voted against her. These votes matter. Roe versus Wade may hang in the balance. Access to birth control and equal pay for equal work. Women, women are entitled to these. This is not right. It's time. I think we're even. Like 15 seconds. Because I, I, I didn't uh, have a chance to respond. I, I didn't vote for your boss, and I hope she proves me wrong. Uh, she didn't have judicial courtroom experience, uh, as I think is a prerequisite, number one. Number two, the Boston Globe, Boston Herald, and the United uh, Chamber of Commerce said, right idea, wrong bill. Need to read the bills to give uh, plaintiff's lawyers an uh, early Christmas to allow them to go in to hurt small businesses. I'm not going to do it. That's 15, and you can take 15 seconds. All I can seconds. say is, like it was with the millionaires and the billionaires and the oil companies, he has a lot of excuses for standing on the other side. But when it came down to it in critical votes, he was not there for women. Massachusetts women deserve a senator they can count on all the time. That's time. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to another question. And this will go first to Ms. Warren. Mitt Romney now wants a larger role for the United States in Syria. He uh, would like to see us helping and uh, working with other nations to supply the rebels there with arms. Uh, what should we do about Syria? And what American involvement or intervention would you support to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon? Well, I think it's clear in Syria that Assad needs to go. What he is doing to his own people is, um, is terrible, and it's got to stop, and he has to go. In the case of Iran, what is absolutely critical is that Iran not be permitted to develop nuclear weapons. They are a danger to the region, they are a danger to our ally Israel, and they are a danger to the entire world. With a nuclear Iran, we not only have the risks of uh, uh, terrorists being able to get access to nuclear weapons, more people
people in the region wanting nuclear weapons. It is destabilizing to the world. And I say that because it means the whole world has an interest in making sure that Iran does not develop nuclear weapons. That's why I support the approach that has been used by President Obama. And that is, he, leaves, he takes nothing off the table when he goes in, but he comes in and tries to work with other countries in order to bring pressure, in order, in this case, in Iran, to put economic sanctions in place. In the case of Syria, to provide support that we think is appropriate. I think that the president is doing the right thing. He's cautious, he's measured, but he is firm. And that's what we need when dealing with that part of the world. I just want to say, I'm really glad to support President Obama as Commander-in-Chief, and I don't want to see Mitt Romney in that job. It's time, and you have 90 seconds, sir. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, as you know, I'm a, I'm a colonel. I'm still serving. I've been in 32 years. I sit on the Armed Services Committee, Homeland. <laughs> I'm Services Committee, Homeland and Veterans. I want to make sure that our soldiers have the tools and resources to do their jobs, do them well, and come home. And if they're not feeling, uh, if they're not well, then we need to get them into the Veterans Administration. Professor Warren said earlier that she wants to uh, cut more military. We've already cut a half a trillion. We can't afford to cut another half a trillion, as she is proposing. Uh, we can't allow uh, Iran to have uh, nuclear weapons. I know that. Uh, I agree with you on that. And that's why I've been working as a leader in the United States Senate to make an effort to destabilize the currency in the central bank in Iran and to make sure that we can use the power of the dollar uh, to get them in line. Also, the draconian sanctions we've done are, are good, but we need to have the president implement them. When it comes to uh, Syria, uh, listen, it's, uh, Assad does need to go, and we need to find and work with the moderates in opposition and provide them with uh, military hardware and support financially so they can battle, because our so our so our, uh, the citizens there, they're being slaughtered by the, by the thousands. When it comes to Libya, I, I, I'm sorry, I thought what, uh, what happened there is unacceptable. I thought the handling of it was unacceptable. We need to have a full and, and, and immediate investigation to make sure that we uh, find out what happened. More importantly, uh, Iran, uh, my opponent said earlier we need a nuanced approach with Iran. There's no such thing. Israel's safety and security is at stake. There's only one person in this race who's, race who's going to stand with Israel uh, without any doubt. Very good, sir. And Ms. Warren, another 30 seconds. Now, um, I have three older brothers, all of whom served in the military. My oldest brother was career military, served 288 combat missions in Vietnam. I have some sense of not only how tough and able and capable our military are, but also how much the family sacrifice and do so willingly when someone is deployed overseas. That's why I believe that the best we can do for our military is be very careful and thoughtful about when we ask them to go to war. We need to have clear objectives. We need to know what our plan is for executing on those and how we plan to get out. It's time. We ended up giving you about 40 seconds, so you can take up to 40 if Thank you wish. As you know, we have the greatest fighting force in the history of, of the world. Uh, our men and women who have served have done a remarkable job. When I served in Afghanistan, I, I saw what the 26th Brigade and our soldiers were doing. And, and when duty calls, uh, they are there. And I'm very proud of that. Uh, we need to make sure that we provide them with the tools and resources. When you're dealing with what's happening over there, it's troubling. The Arab Spring, it's hopeful, but it's also troubling. Uh, we need to make sure that we can work with leaders over there who are not only going to protect our citizens, citizens in the embassies, but we give our em embassy personnel the right information and the right tools to do it themselves. And I'm not quite sure if that was done in the case in Libya. Thank you very much. Uh, another question now. We'll go first to Mr. Brown. BRAC, the base realignment and closure uh, process, could call for cuts at military facilities and many defense-related programs in Massachusetts, perhaps Westover Air Reserve Base in Chicopee, Barnes Air Guard Base in Western Massachusetts. If that happens, where will you stand for cuts to trim the deficit or to preserve Pentagon spending and jobs provided for the economy here in Massachusetts? Jim, great question. I have uh, visited Westover and Barnes. As you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still serving in the National Guard, have been there in that capacity, and also as a senator, making sure sure that we can provide, uh, you know, get a good analysis as to what's going on. I've been already doing it. So uh, the, the jobs at Westover and Barnes in this area are critical. We have a very strong defense, uh, defense industry in Massachusetts, and we need to make sure that we can uh, obviously uh, protect them as well. 
uh, it's going to be a challenge. I worked on the first uh, base uh, closure when I was a state senator. I uh, have been fighting and working now, uh, meeting with the personnel, not only there, but at Hanscom. Hanscom Air Force Base is a jewel when it comes to cybersecurity and to make sure that we provide them. And as a ranking member of armed services and having the, uh, the ability to obviously uh, meet with these people and get the information and, 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 and battle on a consistent basis for them, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that opportunity. Uh, as you know, um, especially with Westover, they have a mission where their, uh, their, their proficiency is so much better than the active forces. And to think that we're going to put that in jeopardy uh, because of some political agenda, I'm not going to do it. I think we both uh, want to support our military. I would argue that based on my personal and, and my, now my experience as being a ranking member in the Armed Services Committee, I have the ability to do it uh, better. Uh, that's not the only challenge when you're talking about uh, stretching the almighty dollars. Uh, we are in a financial emergency, and we need to take an approach where we can actually uh, put everything on the table, uh, looking at that top to bottom review, giving the president a line item veto, trying to make sure that we can do the best with what we have. Thank you, sir. That's time, Ms. Warren, 90 seconds. So I think here's the problem. Uh, we both want to protect the military, but we have a big deficit. And when Senator Brown and the other Republicans take the Grover Nordquist pledge and they say they're not going to raise money from millionaires, they're not going to raise money from billionaires, they're not going to close the oil subsidies, what they're saying in effect is they're just not serious about cutting the deficit, about bringing the budget back into alignment. And what that means is we're going to trigger across-the-board cuts. And across-the-board cuts for the military is the worst possible way we could go. It's bad for the country and it's bad for us here in Massachusetts. And here's why. It just keeps lopping off 10 percent, 15 percent, however much it is. We need to use this opportunity to think about the military we need going forward in the 21st century. Here's what I'm prepared to do. I'm prepared to get out there and fight for Westover to talk about what the C5 galaxy means, how this is the place where we have these giant planes that take big troops, big equipment, and are even used in disaster relief all around the world. And that's why there shouldn't be a penny of cuts there. The cuts need to be in places like the standing army. We don't need the same size standing army as we did when we were fighting two wars. What we need to do is we need to get serious. Put it on the table, meaning including revenues. That's how we get serious. That's how we protect our military. That's time. Mr. Brown, another 30 seconds. Jim, thank you. You know, the millionaires and billionaires and all the buffer rolls, great sound bites, but when you're talking about our military personnel, we have to get serious. And I've been doing that for two and a half years, working to protect the Westover, Hanscom, and all of our military bases as a ranking member of armed services. I've visited there. I've spoken to the leadership. I know what the missions are, and it would be devastating to lose those uh, services in Massachusetts. You said earlier that you want to cut more money from military. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't cut military and protect the C-5s and the missions in Massachusetts. You can't do both. And to think that we're going to do it in any other way by, by, Hi, by, by taxing and spending uh, against our job creators, it's not, it's not going to happen. Thank you, sir. That's time. We'll give you a to be even 37 seconds. Senator Brown is just wrong on this. As long as we don't bring the budget into balance, then they're going to be across the board cuts. And that's what's going to hurt us here in Massachusetts. That's what's going to hurt us at our military bases and the investments we make in research and development here in Massachusetts. What we need to do is get more revenue on the table and get serious about reshaping our military budget. It's no longer about a big standing army. It's about making the investments that we need in the future, cybersecurity, R&D, and the C5 galaxy. And that, that's all the time we have. Believe it or not, we are right up against the clock. Thank you. We have no more time for questions. We're going to closing statements. Again, coin toss determined. Mr. Brown would be first, and you're going to have a minute and 30 seconds, sir. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Professor Warren, all the members of the consortium and folks who are watching and listening. Really, thank you very much. Mayor Ryan, thank you for your support and endorsement. Coos, it's good to see you as well. And I want to just say that, listen, I'm... Uh Aside from my marriage to Gail of 26 years and the birth of my kids, being your senator has been the greatest honor I've ever had. To think someone like me could actually represent Massachusetts with the challenges I've had, like many of you had. And there are many challenges here in western Massachusetts. That's why after the tornado, I was here. I'm continuing to work with Mayor Sano and his team to get the reimbursements to fight to make sure that we can get Springfield and the surrounding areas back on, on its feet. And as somebody who's been working very hard in a truly bipartisan manner to get 
get things done. Trying to, I'm one of those vanishing breed of senators, the ones in the middle who are trying to work together to get things done. This is a time where we need your vote. I'm asking for your vote and support. This is a critical election to Massachusetts. And let me just further say that um, when we're talking about taxes and jobs and spending, uh, the first thing out of anybody's mouth who's running in this race, Professor Warren in particular and her surrogates, is we need to raise taxes. We need to take more money of your hard-earned your hard money and give it to Washington. We can't. Uh, right now, we need to work together in a truly bipartisan manner. I've been doing it. As you know, I vote 54 percent with my party. She referenced somebody the other day, Senator Luger, who she would work with. Well, he votes 86 percent with his party. I'm at 54, so I uh, have been doing uh, exactly that. Basically, 50 percent with both party. I I can't do this alone. I'd appreciate your vote on November 6th. Thank you. I'm sir. Thank you. Please. We are very short on time. One minute, 30 seconds. Ms. Warren, closing statement. So this afternoon, Bruce and I were driving in the car out here to Springfield. We were driving along the same road in the same car that we came this summer when we drove out to Jiminy Peak uh, with our two little granddaughters. And we climbed on all sorts of things and rode fast down the mountain. And it was a reminder to me of what this race is about. For me, this is about our children and about our grandchildren. There are two very different visions of how we build a future for them. Senator Brown and the Republicans believe the way we do that is we cut taxes for those at the very top, and then we let everybody else pick up the pieces. I believe we can do better than that. And we must do better than that. I believe that everybody pays a fair share, even millionaires, even billionaires, even big oil companies. And when everybody pays a fair share, we can all make the investments in the future. We have to invest in education for our children, our public universities, our public schools. We've got to make those investments to have an educated workforce in a real future. We have to make the investments in infrastructure. We see it here in Western Mass. Those investments are what are going to create a future. And we have to invest in research. Look, that's what it's about for me. I'm asking for your vote so that together we can build a real future for all of our children and our grandchildren. Thank you very much.